Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're just going to give it a few more minutes to let some more folks join, and then we will get started shortly. We should have set it up so the Earth Day playlist that you guys created could be playing while we're waiting, like, you know, lobby music or something fun. Yes, that is a great idea. So with that, I think we'll get started. Um, I. I'm so happy that you all are joining us this evening. My name is Chessa Ramachani and I work for the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary Environmental Nonprofit located in Wilmington. And tonight we have a really cool webinar for you, um, really a conversation about community gardens in Wilmington. Um, I first want to share a little bit about um, what we are doing this week for Earth and Arbor celebration. Um, so we have um, a lot of cool events happening all week, including two more webinars, uh, as well as educational activities, our scavenger hunt and giveaways. So you can go to delawareestuary.org slash earth and arbor to see all of that information. Um, and I really wanna point out our try it giveaway for today. So go show us how plants can help power your Monday. So if you prepared a meal featuring some vegetables, or maybe you started some new plants this week, or you just go on a walk and you see a new uh, flower or tree that you think is really cool, go on our website and you can enter our giveaway to win um, a four week home delivery from Second Chances Farm. Um, so you can enter all week long for that prize and there'll be different uh, prizes each day relating to our Earth Day theme. So be sure to check that out and enter on our website. So this evening we have our uh, webinar called The Dirty Secrets of Community Gardens, and we have a great lineup for you, um, including uh, Shanae Darby, Cecilia Rich, Madison Walter, and Jess Westcott. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I'm so grateful that they're all here um, and they're going to share some really great information with you all. So with that, I will hand it over to Shanae for our introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Shanae Darby. I am second district city council for our lovely city of Wilmington. And I am here today in full support of community gardens in Wilmington to have this conversation about what it looks like, community engagement, having these conversations I think are important and having urban gardens and exposing our community to this is really important. I actually um, have a community garden, but I have a little spin to as a community healing and art garden. So it's a lot about um, addressing some of the traumas in our community and bringing like meditation and sound healing and like the different aspects of healing into it and also the arts to the, well, my community garden is in, around the corner from my house. So 
the second district pretty much bringing arts and healing for the community here. Um, and that's really like my focus and being able to like partner with the local daycares and the, the kids in our community to teach them about how to grow their own food, um, how to um, just really be in, engaged and in tune with nature. Um, something that we just have been cut off from uh, or told that our community, we don't do nature or we um, don't participate in like hiking or gardening or things of that nature. So like trying to bring those things back to our community, to our community, I think is really important. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation. And I think it's really key like tonight to talk about like community engagement is so key. A lot of community gardens come into Wilmington. I think great intentions, you know, want to beautify the community. However, the community engagement part is not happening. Um, they're not engaging. A community garden will pop up and the neighbor won't even know or be engaged into what's going on at that space. Um, so I think it's really important that we have that conversation tonight. And then the second part of that conversation is how do we network? How do we work together? How do we provide each other with support? And then on a city council end, um, they're having conversations around um, what does what regulations or what provisions does it take to set up a garden, to monitor a garden. So they're about to start having these conversations. And I want to make sure that urban gardeners, the community are involved in that conversation. So I'm just a big supporter. I'm glad just to be here tonight. I can't stay for long, um, but I wanted to at least come and say that I was in full support. And um, thank you for this forum. Yes, thank you so much for joining today. And I we really appreciate to hear uh, your support and everything um, that you are doing in support of community gardens. It's really amazing. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Cecilia to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Cecilia Rich of The Village Tree. <clears throat> and um, we are a... Uh, community engaged garden um, that I have, um, I, I, and Shane, thank you so much for opening it up. Um, and it just opened up the uh, a can of worms that we that, that really needs to be discussed. And that is um, engaging the community. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that basically uh, serves as a resource hub and we try to empower and um, encourage the community to show ways and means to uh, of, of sustaining um, self-sufficiency and um, uh, sustainability within the community and within their families. So um, I know there is a lot of talk about a lot of community gardens that actually grow flowers. We at our garden grow produce because that's how we sustain our life. We got to eat. And that is our common denominator. And that's how we meet with the community. If you feed them, they will come. So that is our um, goal and has been our passion, but we also serve as a resource hub. So when they come to our garden, they leave more than just with produce, they also leave with additional information that other organizations tend to offer. Um, I have personally invited um, many uh, council people and past and present to visit our garden. And I have yet to see any of them uh, come to our garden. So our invitation is still open and continues to be open. Our address is 214 Delmore Place. We are a um, some of our board members call us a diamond in the rough because it's a rough area, you know, where, I, where I'm at. And that's how we meet with the community and we engage in the community. Um, I literally actually invited our illustrious mayor to our garden and when I gave him the address, his whole attitude has changed. So if it's about change, what we do is we plant social change in the community and we meet people um, where they are and call them out on it. And um, I, I kind of um, am that, that, that ripple in the wave. And so we got to figure out which way we're going to run that current. Are we going to run it to uh, looking at the problem or working on a solution? Yeah, so that's where we are. 
Great, thank you, questions? Cecilia. Okay. <laughs> so happy to have you here. Thank um, you. Next up, Maddie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. So, hi everyone. My name is Madison Walter, Maddie, and uh, I wear several different hats in sort of the community garden urban ag world of northern, you know, Newcastle County. Um, in my daytime hours, I serve as the urban ag coordinator for the Newcastle Conservation District. So as a conservation district, we work with homeowners and landowners to implement various types of conservation practices on varying scales. Um, but as the urban ag coordinator, I have much more narrow focus where I work with community gardens to provide technical assistance, everything from grant writing, volunteer management to more of, you know, the hands on stuff, how to build raised beds and, you know, plant seeds and that kind of a thing. I also oversee our um, urban farmer and gardener mini grant program, as well as do various urban ag based education programming. Um, in addition to that, I also serve on the steering committee of the Delaware Urban Farm and Food Coalition, and I'm the co-chair of the coalition's community garden committee. Uh, so we oversee network building for our community gardens and provide assistance to them in varying capacities, as well as host networking events. We had one this past March. We host monthly or bi-monthly movie nights um, and things of that nature. And then lastly, I also serve as a co-manager of the Duffy's Hope Youth Garden um, over on 9th and Church Street in Wilmington. Um, so with the lovely folks over at Duffy's Hope, um, we run a small community garden over there. So that's kind of a, an overview of where I'm coming from in terms of community gardens in Wilmington. Great, thank you, Maddie. And uh, Jessica, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, I'm Jessica Westcott. I am the founder of Planting to Feed Inc. We're located out right, out, right here outside of Wilmington. Um, so we have two community gardens in the city of Wilmington. Um, both are kind of residing in the Riverside area. Um, our main mission, our main goal is to make sure that our community has access to quality foods. Um, and I believe, and Planty to Feed believes that your access to those quality foods shouldn't be dictated by your zip code. And so with that, we have um, spun up two community refrigerators in the state of Delaware. Um, we're looking to open quite a few more um, in the coming months because you know it, it's great that we have so many agencies and so many organizations that are helping people get access to food but sometimes those organizations have hours and what happens to people that are, are shift workers or don't have the conventional hours, how do they get access to food? And so the community refrigerators is one way um, that we see um, to meet that gap. So thank you so much for having me here and having Planted to Feed here. I'm super excited um, for the discussion. I think this is going to be a really fun event. Great, thank you so much. We're happy to have you. Um, before we get into the questions, I just wanna let all of our attendees know that you can use the Q&A box to type in questions. If you have a question that you'd like discussed or a topic that you would like to hear more about, please use that throughout the event to um, ask your questions and we will get to those um, as well. Uh, so first off, I think um, it would be great to just sort of get right into community gardens and you know discuss a little bit about why community gardens are so important to residents of Wilmington um, from any perspective really environmentally, socially, um, economically, really what is the value of these spaces to the residents of Wilmington? I would say in my, my opinion, um, making sure that there's access, right? Um, we have a lot of grocery stores here in Delaware, but a lot of them are not in the areas um, close enough for residents to get to. So if you don't have a car, um, there isn't public transportation, how are you supposed to get fresh groceries or how are you supposed to get fresh produce, right? Um, getting on the bus, yeah, you can do that, but then you're only taking what you can carry between your two hands. 
Um, so I think it's really important to make sure that our communities do have um, urban gardens or community gardens um, available to them. Um, and I also think it's important that those community gardens are open. They're not locked up, right? Um, I, I have the opinion that um, if someone needs the food, I rather them just take it. Um, I don't I don't consider that stealing. I consider that a need that's that's being met. So that's just my opinion on that. I agree. Um, I actually uh, have two flower beds outside of my garden. Um, I had to lock mine up based on where I'm located because a lot of my things kind of started walking out. Um, and that was the tools. However, there are there were herbs and fruits that actually grow outside in flower beds for people to be able to help themselves. And they're able to access uh, some of the, the peppers and other um, vegetations from you know, alongside the sidewalk and they, they help themselves. So. I think as far as, you know, benefits, I mean, as from, you know, working a lot in community gardens in different capacities, one of the things that I'm always amazed about is that a community garden is never just a garden. It's never just a couple tomato plants plants. It's never just a couple of raised beds, right? It's not only is it providing, you know, access to food, but it's also providing, you know, social capital and a place for people to gather. It provides opportunities for economic opportunities. Um, you know, it has tremendous environmental benefits, you know, everything from reducing urban heat island effect to cleaning your air to, you know, having healthy, you know, soil, which is super critical to the function of, you know, our climate. Um, so community gardens, you know, not only benefit in one way, they benefit in so many ways, and often a lot of ways that people don't think of, you know, they really are sort of this hub for social change and providing, you know, equity to so many folks. Um, so there really are a powerful tool for whatever you know kind of change you want to make happen so they really just are chock full of benefits what i've learned while we were doing um in the short period of time that i have had the garden a lot of times people never even really notice the benefits out of the garden and when we uh, um when i have the garden open People just come in and just walk around and just have that. It's very therapeutic. It's that escape that's in the concrete jungle. And it gives them the opportunity to just literally, well, I don't have roses, but I do have lavender and sage. So, <laughs> so they go over to the herb section and they, they just like have that aromatherapy, you know, and pick some mint and, and just have that 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 place of a few minutes to release and and it's like and then they go back and go back to their 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 normality but it gives them i call it um a speed bump to just slow down and we need to just take that time out you know and that's why i have most of that's where i do every mostly everything if they want to meet me meet me at the garden you know, and, 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 and embrace it and enjoy the outdoors because a lot of times we're so caught up and especially now, you know, everyone has been talking about, you know, the, the coronavirus and it, it has been a, it has been a blessing and a curse. Um, our blessing is the fact that we were, we are a, a, an organization in operation and we are outside. So we had the opportunity to be able to still allow, have social distancing and still allow people to take that breath, step outside and, and, and be able to, um, access healthy foods. Um, we have a grocery store that was like two blocks away from us, never let us know, but it has shut down. So I am in the middle of a food desert because the closest um, place to get a fresh produce would probably be two, out, uh, two miles one direction and um, 
yeah, two miles in the next, in the other direction. So, sorry. Um, um, sorry about that. I thought I saw this thing. Anyway, um, we've, we've been able to still, you know, we're just in the beginning of the season, but people are already putting their orders in. And it's so, you know, it's good that um, we can see that there's a need. People are being more health conscious and being uh, more aware of what they're putting in their body. So it, it Madison is absolutely right. It's more than just a garden. It's 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 a it's a hub for release, relate, relax, and um, be able to um, uh, connect. I love that. And if I could just add into that, um, one thing I go to my garden to restore. If I'm having a bad day, or if I need to clear my head. Um, there's no place like my garden. And sometimes I'll just be in the soil. My team makes fun of me because I don't wear gloves. I like to like get my nails in there dirty. I like to have like dirt up to my elbows. Um, and that's just my release. In the beginning, it wasn't so much like that, but um, there is some research on the mental health benefits of, of gardens as well. And I, I would I would implore the community to definitely do some do some research on that and just, just give it a gander, give it a try. Um, my mental health is completely in the summer. It, it's so much better because I, I spend so much time um, in the garden. And I think that's also not only is it, you know, the act of actually garden and being in the space, but even just having you know a garden that you're able to walk by having it be an asset in your community also you know provides you sort of these auxiliary benefits of you know it increases maybe the diversity of you know the plant life on your you know particular block right and diversity is you know as a sort of large environmental principle you know equates to resiliency and health and pretty much everything um you know it having you know something alive and growing next to you, even if you don't directly interact with it, can completely change your mood. There's tons of studies that have come out, uh, you know, about urban greening and how that can benefit. And so having something that provides all those benefits and produces food and, you know, as closer and more you get into it, the more benefits you get is really, you know, there's just so many layers. Absolutely. To piggyback off on that, um, also, you know, welcome. Um, I do have done workshops and still plan to continue to do workshops with um, uh, the master gardeners because I don't know everything. And so I invite them out and people want to know about the soil. People want to know about the past and who to look out for. You know, um, I can't always call on Madison as my go-to person. <laughs> You know, uh, we were having a conversation just yesterday about, you know, uh, seeding, you know, how to, you know, get when you, when your uh, produce is flowering, how to do the seeding. So that's a process. And and I think people need uh, um, would benefit when they realize that they can do the reality is that they can do the same thing that we're doing in their garden right there in their house, you know. So I also teach container gardening, wind, uh, windowsill gardening. Um, uh, a while ago, my mother had lost her taste of her, her, her taste buds. She wasn't tasting her food. So I set up a, a wind, windowsill herb garden and it, you know, when she was able to grow the herbs and just pick them right off and her uh, taste buds started to come back. So it has so much benefits to um, to just on a small range and just on a little range. And I need to say, um, and this is one of my movements for this year, we need to engage the children more because it's our children that are going to spark the household. And it's their children that's going to learn that produce isn't grown on the fruit stand you know, and how is it accessed, you know, giving, letting them know it's okay to play in the dirt. So we're going to get the kids involved and, and, and let them encourage, you know, because you'd be surprised out of the mouth of babes what happens and what can um, 
you can explore. You know, many parents is like, I don't like these vegetables. So the kids won't like the vegetables, but if they try it, you never know. You might have a household actually wanting to eat some more fruits and vegetables. I love that, Cecilia. I <laughs> I um, always brag about my niece who's been gardening with me since she was one years old. Um, and now she knows all of her fruits and vegetables. It's so cute. I just recently shared a video of her like talking about apples and tomatoes and peppers. And I'm just like, you're not even three. How do you know these, these vegetables and fruits? But it's because she spends a lot of time in the garden and she's also really good with the, her veggies because her mom exposes her to those. So I, I totally agree. We definitely have to get our kiddos involved in the garden and what better way than to just, you know, bring them in and, and show them where their food actually comes from. So I totally agree. And in many ways, I think community gardens, you know, not only are you able to see some of those, you know, specialty crops like your tomatoes and peppers, and things of that nature, but it also provides sort of this connection to the sort of larger agricultural landscape as well. It can be sort of your entry point into understanding, you know, how the rest of the food system comes together. While you may not be able to, you know, grow bushels of wheat, you know, on an urban block, um, you can, you know, you understand the basic processes of how one, you know, would grow something. So then if you come across and you're learning more about you know, maybe conventional ag, you have a point of reference if it also is happening where directly where you live. So again, as an outreach and communication tool for the food system in general, it's really amazing. I think that those are all such great perspectives on really different facets of community gardens and why they are so important. Um, I'm curious to know from you all what some of the misconceptions are that you've heard about community gardens that maybe you would um, like people to know more about that aren't as familiar with uh, gardens. I can start. Um, I would say that you have to have land or you have to have soil to grow or like ground soil to grow. Um, I started container gardening. Um, there literally would not be a planting to feed if it wasn't for dollar store pots that I poked holes in and filled with dollar store soil. Um, so that's the, mis the biggest misconception. You don't need to have land. All you need is $3, $1 for a bucket, $1 for a pack of seeds, and $1 for some soil and, and some water. <laughs> And, and you can grow, um, you don't need to have land to grow. So just start with something simple like tomatoes. I feel like they grow like weeds. So you start with something simple like tomatoes or peppers and, and you can do it right from the dollar store. That's exactly how I started. Amen to that. Yeah, it's definitely, it doesn't have to be, you know, this big, you know, enterprise, you can do it on your balcony. Absolutely. I, yeah, I have done in the past laundry basket potatoes, you know, where you do, yeah, laundry basket from, you know, the dollar store. And I used the like paper bag that, you know, they gave me when with my purchase to line it. And I mean, yeah, it was easy as that. Um, I think something else that often comes up when it comes to gardens um, and this is sort of the case any time that we start bringing nature closer to us into environments where it isn't typically found. Um, and that is, you know, sort of misconceptions about what nature is and what it's supposed to do and how we're supposed to interact with it. You know, oftentimes this comes in the form of, you know, perceived pests or animals that you're bringing in. Um, and often a lot of times these animals are actually providing really important services that folks don't know about. I mean, I think of like possums, which my brother was obsessed with possums when he was like a small kid. Like he wrote a whole story. It was a whole thing. Um, but he, uh, you know, was so possums have always kind of been the star in our family, but they like eat like thousands of ticks a night and you know, they do all of these like important things um, and they're a little scary looking. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, they aren't the cutest creatures in the world. Um, so they can be, you know, frightening if you don't understand, you know, what their role is in sort of the larger 
system that we're living in. And, you know, folks working to educate themselves on sort of what they're seeing if they're not used to seeing and what these animals actually, you know, do. I know there's lots of organizations that have resources out there. Um, I even think I saw today, you know, the Brandywine Zoo is have has a whole sort of education around, you know, urban wildlife. Um, so, you know, you can check out that and sort of learn more about the, you know, animals that you're inviting into your space and how cool that can be. And you know, again, sort of this learning teachable moment that can happen when you have community gardens. I think every day is a teachable moment. And I think um, one of the misconceptions is that a lot of times people are hesitant to come in because they think it's gonna cost them something. And, um, and, and I, when I open my gate, it is that the gate is open and I tell them, this is not my garden. This is your garden because it's in your community. So if you, you, know, you pick it, you plant it. Real simple, you know, it's called reciprocity, you know, so, you know, I, I encourage people to come in and I have like, you know, little uh, trowels and, and small shovels uh, at, at the gate, you know, start digging. Um, it's very cathartic as well. Um, getting people to have that opportunity. If there's something that's bothering you, you can, you can dig it, you know, um, and, um, the cool thing about our garden is we have a, a couple um, uh, grills. So um, and so we've had um, some some professional chefs come out and they've been actually cooking food that has been from the garden. And um, it, so you can you can dig it, you can burn it, you can do whatever you, you know. And, and and people get that opportunity to explore and understand that. Um, it, it, it's it's a very holistic approach. Um, the other misconception is is that, um, and I find people feel as though that they have to commit. And um, I tell people, you know, fifteen minutes, thirty minutes, an hour. You know, whenever you get a chance, you know, we're welcome. You know, that's why I keep the, you know, the, the gate may be closed, but our contact information is right at the door. So all you got to do is call. And, and, and that's with anything that we do. And that's that holistic approach at the village tree. So it's our motto is it takes a village to raise a village. So a lot of times it's about educating, you know, and, and, and what I've been, um, and I can only speak for the village tree, is that the challenges, um, I'm, 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 I'm sad that um, Shane wasn't able to stay on, but our challenges is the, is the pushback, you know, and it's not just from the city, it's, it's, it's statewide, you, because of, you know, someone needs to speak, and I'm that type of person, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the middle of the room, you know, the inequities of what's happening, because um, there are some organizations that focuses just on um, exotic plants. We're not eating exotic food. We're just eating basic kale, tomatoes, peppers, collards, lettuce, you know, things of that nature. Let's keep it simple. We have to start simple when for in order for our community to be able to engage. And we're not trying to, um, we're not just trying to beautify the community, but we're trying to beautify the individuals as well. I think that's really important to discuss, Cecilia, and I think that gets to my next question and sort of what Shanae was mentioning in the beginning um, also is how do we ensure that, you know, the areas where the community gardens are, um, are benefiting the residents and the, the people that really live next to the community garden. So if, you know, if there's other organizations that are interested in starting gardens, how do you make sure that the, the people that are in close proximity to that area, the people in that community are the ones benefiting from and engaging with those gardens. 
So I think the first thing is, you know, making sure that when you start a garden that you are coming from the community. I mean, that really should be your first step. I know, you know, it doesn't always happen that way, but, you know, making sure that a community wants a garden before you put it in, that there's already community buy-in before you put your first shovel into the ground, right? Like that is going to make sure that they're along, you know, for the whole ride and making sure that they feel like they have their voice, you know, being heard and that they give input and that the garden functions in a way that it actually needs to serve. You know, community gardens all differ. There's a wide range of different types of community gardens. Some are more youth focused, some are more production, some have, you know, maybe a more therapeutic, you know, element to it. But it's making sure that when you're building the garden, that you're actually building it to almost the specifications of that particular neighborhood, that particular community. And I think that, you know, if you aren't able to do that, which again, I think if you aren't, you're gonna have some struggles. It's not impossible, but it definitely makes it more challenging. But making sure, and I believe Cecilia mentioned this earlier, that, you know, you invite them into the space make them know that it's okay for them to occupy that space. I mean, Jess talked about it too, you know, not having, you know, locks and having it be open. And, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, a formal invitation first to get people to come in. You can't always rely on them just passing by and wandering in. Um, there might be some perception that they don't belong there. Um, I think about it, very similar to any type of new situation that I've ever been in, you know, recently, you know, I was like going to a new doctor for the first time. Right. And as I'm like driving over there, I was like, okay, Oh, look past that building. Okay. I've never been here before. I had to flip around, you know, I go in there. Oh, where's the reception desk. Right. There's all of these questions. I didn't know it was, you know, you get flustered. The same thing happens if you've never been to a community garden. Right. So if you're trying to figure it out and you're, you know, maybe scared of navigating all those choices, doing it wrong, even though in community gardens, trust me, there are no wrong ways to interact with it. That does not exist. Um, but there might be that perception. So having sort of a way to formally invite people in to show them the ropes, to make them comfortable in that space um, can be a really great way to make sure that they know that they are supposed to be in there. So. Um... I obtained my garden in 2018. And um, before I got the garden, I went to very, I did my homework and I introduced myself to current, um, at that time, uh, council people. Um, and I let them know what my intentions were. Um, and so far only one person has come to my garden. Um, and I do formally invite them. So that's what kind of gets me is that you can't complain about something that you have not experienced or know very little about. And it's just by hearsay, because when they, when people do come to my garden, they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. So take the time out so that you can't call anyone out if you're not going to step out. So again, I'm calling them out and that's what we do. Come on out to the garden. Let's not sit in cushy chairs and have meetings and talk about what we wanna talk about for future uh, uh, programs. Come on out to the garden and see what we do and not just uh, turn your blind eye behind the fact that it's in the community that they would not necessarily frequent. It's part of their city. So they are responsible for it and they should be looking out and it should not be just stuck in the, a certain district because if you're a city council person a mayor a politician a governor um and a shout out to tizzy lockman um shout out to vash turner because they have come to my garden um and so that's senator senator Elizabeth Lockman, and they see what I'm doing. They have taken the time out, but the people that's local, they don't wanna go outside of their district. And that's kind of scary because if you're speaking for the city, don't just speak for your district. And that's all I have to say about that one. I think they, they both covered it 
pretty great. I, I will just add that I had a great learning opportunity for myself. Um, I was partnering with um, Wilmington Land Bank looking for a new property um, to open up another community garden and the neighbors told me no. They did not want me there. And I didn't push back. I could have, I could have, I could have fought and said, well, my paperwork's already signed. I'm going to start digging. Um, but it was a good learning lesson for me, right? Just because I want to do something uh, or just because planting to feed wants to do something, that doesn't mean it's necessarily what the community wants. Um, and so we did not break <laughs> ground in that land and we found a different property that that wanted us there and we tell the neighbors all the our, that property it's right next to the Howard Young prison it's no locks it's wide open um, we tell the neighbors that live on that street hey if you see something that you like come and grab a tomato we were experimenting with sweet potatoes come and grab a sweet potato you just got to get a little dirty to get to it um, but yeah you you all are very welcome uh, but I agree with Cecilia, you have to really, and, and Maddie, you have to talk to the, the community before you just start putting your shovels in the ground, because if, if the community doesn't want you there, they'll make it known. Um, and, and why make it so difficult to, you know, go somewhere that, that wants you and that embraces you. Right. Um, but don't just make the assumption, um, based off of what you want to do. So that's the only thing I would add to that. Great, we did have um, some questions from our audience. So one sort of um, does go along with what we were just discussing. Um, how can you all collectively pull the local politicians into the room, churches and other businesses to help bring the discussion to all in need? Um, so I think Cecilia, you really touched on this that you you know invite people to the garden itself, not you know some other meeting place, but to the garden. And I think from your perspective, um, you invite and invite and it is, you know, up to uh, that group, whether they engage with that discussion or not. Um, but any other other comments to add to that question? I would say that I mentioned earlier the Delaware Urban Farm and Food Coalition, um, which is a it's a networking group that's, you know, people who are interested in urban ag and local food issues. Um, we actually have a quarterly meeting um, that's coming up on Wednesday. Um, so if you can find us on Facebook, the Delaware Urban Farm and Food Coalition, and you can find, you know, information about that. But that really is a place that is designed to bring all of the voices together. We're working on finding, you know, all of those voices uh, make sure that we have representation from all of the aspects of this and inviting them to those kinds of meetings, participating in those meetings, so we can have those discussions with everybody at the table and work, you know, to find solutions together and after hearing from all of those perspectives. I would just add, um, so my background is in math, uh, so I always lead with the data. Right. And so I, I collect my data and I say, you know, the impact that I'm making. Um, I'm always like Cecilia, inviting people out to the garden. Um, you can reach out to me. You can DM me, PM me. I don't know what the kids call it these days, but <laughs> you can reach out to me um, and just ask questions. I, you know, I, use your networks. Right. I, I'm not originally from Delaware, but. I do feel like I have a great network here in Delaware. And so I'm always tapping people. Um, and my corporate life, I call it shooting my shot. Um, so I never feel embarrassed about asking somebody um, a question or asking somebody to come out and, and support something that I'm doing. Um, the worst thing that somebody will say to me is no or no, thank you. Hopefully they say no, thank you. Um, so yeah, I would say just use your network. Um, be open, um, come with data. I'm a data kind of gal. <laughs> I'm with you. If, if, if we don't have the numbers that back, back it up and, and demonstrate the, the effects, then I, we're, we're, we're just pedaling backwards. But one thing that, I, I, that just came to my mind, um, the panelists, it seems like everyone on the panel is not originally from Wilmington. 
that says something. That really says something. How vested is Wilmington in Wilmington? I'm just, that's a rhetorical question and I'm gonna leave that one alone. However, I also want to um, mention a comment. Um, I was in an earlier meeting um, with the Sierra Club and um, it, it seems that there's a concern and there's, there's a holistic concern in regards to food insecurity and um, the access to our food and not just plant and beautification of community and um, community gardens. And um, I think at this point in this juncture, we are beyond food being food insecure. But what I'm seeing is inequities of support of our um, local, state, and governmental level of support of grassroots organization. And it appears that we are in a food apartheid as opposed to a food desert or food insecurity. There is, has to, you know, I, people who know me, they know we're going to talk about that elephant in the middle of the room and not question what that smell is. And it is what it is. And unless we're going to address it, then we're just going to have a meeting about a meeting. And you know what? Come on, meet me 214 Delmore Place. Let's set up an appointment. We can have it. We can talk about it. We can dig it and we can plan it. <laughs> and that's my soapbox. I'm done for the evening. <laughs> I think I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. We did have another question come in, I think for Jessica, of how does the community fridge program work and where are they normally located, if you wanna uh, answer that? Yeah, sure. So right now, as I mentioned, there's two community fridges. One is at Kingswood Community Center, 2300 Bower Street in Wilmington. The other fridge is at the Teen Warehouse and that's 1121 Thatcher Street in Wilmington. Look at me on my addresses. I studied those. Um, I usually just drive straight there. I don't always have the address, um, but I drive straight there. So yeah, the two community fridges are right there um, in the Riverside area. The community fridge is open 24 by seven. Our goal is to make sure that when you are hungry and you need some food, you can get to it without any barriers. Um, the community is open to also donating food. There are a few items we ask that you do not put in the refrigerator, like cans or meats, um, just because, you know, meats can drop and drip and create some, some, a little bit of mess um, in the fridge. But if you do have meats, um, you can put them in the freezer for now. Um, we also take uh, some dry goods at the 2300 Bower Street location where we have a small pantry. Um, just ask that if you donate any food that it makes its way into the small pantry and into the fridge and not um, left outside um, of those locations. Um, we thought the fridge was going to be like a one-off kind of like project that we filled once a week. Um, but now we're up to filling it about twice a week. Uh, and we're looking forward to the summer months where we're harvesting, where we will start taking um, our harvest and putting it directly in the fridge. Actually, we just did our first harvest to fridge. Shout out to DJ, who is an intern on our team who helped us do harvest to fridge. He's a high school student right now. Um, and he harvested some cabbage, some um, uh, carrots, some radishes, and some other little things um, that we grew over the winter. So we're really excited to jump into that harvest to fridge um, motion in the next coming months. If you have any additional questions about the community refrigerators, or if you would like to open up or host a community refrigerator, please feel free um, to reach out to us. Thanks for the question. That's great, thank you. Um, we had another question from the audience. What do you think might cause people to not want a community garden? <laughs> I'm sorry. This word, I mean, that's yeah. hard work. <laughs> yeah, the plants can't grow themselves. It's a commitment. Um, and, and, and it's a lot of work. Um, and, and, and what I do is basically a labor of love. And, um, you know, it, it, but it starts with a seed. You know, that's how we got started, from a seed. 
So, um, and, and, and it, it, it's just work. That's a great question. Um, I would also take it another, um, maybe why the community may not want a community garden. Um, and in our case, it was the perception that we were coming into their neighborhood and didn't want to talk to them at all and that we were gonna take their greenery or take their land and, and not include them. Um, so I think, again, that's, that's another conversation that needs to be had with the community prior to putting your shovels um, into the ground. And if I could redo that process, um, I would have talked to the neighbors before I signed my paperwork um, and just explain like, hey, I'm out here. We're, we're wanting to bring this to you um, and for you, and we want you to be active participants. So if I, if I spin that question in a different perspective, um, maybe it could be the perception that you're coming into somebody else's home um, without permission. For me, I've actually, um, the, the, the neighbors on the block where, where my garden is, they have the combination. They, they, and, and they're like, look, the, um, the grass was getting a little high and you see, we whacked it. I was like, it's your garden. So let's do it. So um, it, when, you, when you open, open it's, if it's called a community garden, then that's what it should be. And it's for the community. So, um, and, and it, it, that's why our motto is, you know, it takes a village to raise a village and we need to do it together. Um, uh, a lot of times people, you know, we make mistakes too. It's all about experimenting, you know. Um, one of um, our neighbors, they were trying to help out and I went away and I said, oh, help yourself to some of those collard greens if you want to pick them. I came back, I came back and they actually pulled them you know, and they put them on my compost container. Fortunately, I got back in enough time and I replanted that and the collard greens are actually coming back. And so I want them to see that we can regenerate, we can um, reconnect, we can um, recycle what we have. Yeah, so, um, and, and when they came back and they actually saw and it was like, they felt bad, but I was like, it's no problem. You know, we, 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 that's why they put erasers on pencils. You know, if there's a mistake, we can fix it. Yep. I mean, I think that's, I'm so glad you shared that story. I remember, I remember when this happened to Cecile Cobb and she's like, ah, and I was like, oh, because we all have, I mean, that's kind of the territory when it comes to community gardens and working with folks. Um, and that's, I mean, it's part of the adventure and part of the, and being able to have an environment where it's okay to make mistakes and be like, whoops, shouldn't have done that, um, you know, and be able to re-put it in the ground or be like, oh, we'll just start some more seeds or whatever the solution may be. You know, we don't really get a lot of those places in our life where it's openly okay to make mistakes and to, you know, do something incorrect and be okay with it. You know, there's so many things in community gardens that are outside of your control. Um, you know, there's the weather, there's the sort of every living element, whether it's insects, whether it's other people, whether it's, you know, other plants that you don't want there. And being able to put yourself in a space where you're always learning, where you're learning to be okay with mistakes that you make, you know, it's a very rewarding, it's very cathartic, it's, you know, translates into other aspects of your life to be kind to yourself and remember that you are human, that you're always growing, um, just like a garden, right? You're always growing. Yeah, that's, that's great. We are almost at time, which I can't believe. I'm really enjoying listening to all of your uh, perspective, but I thought a good question to maybe end on is really what people can do to help support community gardens in Wilmington. So whether they're involved with the community garden now, whether they have one in their neighborhood, but they're not really, you know, involved in it, or if they don't have something in their garden, what's maybe something that they can do to help support um, the, the growth of community gardens in the city? Um, you got to step outside, um, get off the porch, and come on out um, 
And also, um, you can check out our website, thevillagetree.org. You can volunteer at any time. As a matter of fact, um, this uh, for, for me personally, but even though it may be personal, I try to share what I do personally with the community. So this is during the month of my, blah, blah, blah. during the month of Ramadan, we are actually doing an iftar um, and we're feeding the community and um, inviting them to come out to the community. And we're we, um, part of the uh, iftar is sponsored by uh, a local private uh, community school, which is uh, Dura Amana that's on the east side. And so we will be serving on the 30th of April um, meals. And be, before they break their fast, people can come and grab and go. We will be, you know, definitely paying attention to the COVID restrictions. So everything will be prepackaged. You just grab, say what you want, grab, go, have it in a bag, and you'll be able to break your fast, or you can eat it right then if you're not fasting, and and take it with you. And you have an opportunity to see what we do at the garden because we're more than just planting flowers. So it's the village tree .org, um, and you can um, uh, donate, you can um, volunteer. Uh, there are, um, uh, there's a uh, link there for you to um, want to volunteer. And even if you have questions and comments, it's open. I always say um, donate in the forms of your time. Um, your talent and your funds. Um, those are the three things that us community gardens could really use. Um, I, I know for us, like the time and talents is like gold. Um, and of course we can always use and appreciate when people donate financially as well, um, because we're able to do or sustain larger projects. And if, if it wasn't for our donors, we would not have been able or would not have had the capital um, to spin up our community refrigerator program. And so we're really grateful for our financial um, donors there um, as well. But definitely as we're coming into the harvest months, time and talents, um, we can totally, totally, totally use. I mean, I yes, got- plantingspeed.org. Sorry, Manny. <laughs> oh no, I stepped on your toes. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I don't think you can, you know, sum it up better than that. I mean, these most community gardens are volunteer, you know, run. Um, so, you know, contributing in any way that you can. But I'll also say that, you know, supporting policies, supporting other organizations that support community gardens um, is another avenue that you can go. Even something as simple as, you know, supporting your local garden centers, right? If you're half, if you're buying maybe some flowers for your own, you know, yard, buying them from a local place. Those local garden centers, you know, do so much to give back to other community gardens. It's all this giant, you know, network. And so thinking about that system and supporting, you know, things that support gardens um, is another route to go. Thank you all. Those are definitely some good action items I think that we can uh, take away from this uh, panel. And thank you, Cecilia, Jessica, and Maddie for joining us this evening. Um, I really, I learned a lot and I'm really happy uh, to have heard some more about your perspectives on these topics. Um, and I hope all of our attendees enjoyed uh, the presentation and the conversation this evening. Um, and you can obviously uh, learn more about the uh, Earth and Arbor Day celebration on our website. Um, and thank you to the city of Wilmington for sponsoring us. And just everyone, thank you so much for joining. And um, yeah, thanks again to our panelists for a, a great evening and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings.